escuchas LACNIC Podcast. Construimos una comunidad regional para una mejor Internet global. LACNIC Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of our LACNIC Podcast. My name is Carlos Martinez, I am LACNIC's Chief Technical Officer and I will be your host today. So, as our audience knows, RPKI is a set of different technologies that are used to mitigate certain security vulnerabilities and risks present in the Internet's routing system. RPKI allows IP resource holders to document their intended originating autonomous system and also lets backbone operators filter out prefixes and routes that fail said tests. Today here with me, I have Tim Brysels, a longtime friend of, our, of me and of Lagnix. Uh, Tim currently works for NNet Labs, a Dutch non-profit organization which specializes in creating and maintaining software that is very widely used to run some specific internet infrastructure services. Among other things, NNet Labs maintains several well-known projects, nine names like Unbound, NSD, OpenDNSSEC, Shirley, ring a bell to most of our audience. They also maintain two key software projects directly related to RPKI, the Validator Routinator, and the CA software, Krill. So, welcome, Tim. It's a pleasure for me to have you here with us. Would you care to introduce yourself and introduce uh, your company, and NLED Labs? <laughs> um, thank you, Carlos. Um, I think you already did a, a great introduction. Um, yeah, indeed. My name is Tim Ruizels. I'm a... Uh, uh, I th the official job title is uh, Senior Software Engineer at Anana Maps, but in practice um, I do everything from um, reaching out to people using the software, planning what needs to be done, um, support, uh, and implementing the code. So I think the job is actually quite um, uh, broad and um, encompass encompassing all the aspects of uh, what we do, and that's uh, how a lot of people work uh, at Anana Maps. Um, I've been involved in the RPKI for um, 15 years, I think. First, when I worked at uh, Ripe NCC, and later uh, as uh, yeah, as a developer at uh, Anana Labs. So I've been going to uh, more ITFs than I can count. <laughs> I've implemented two and a half uh, RPKI CA solutions. <laughs> yes, one at the Ripe NCC, one as a hobby, but that got abandoned. And then uh, now Krill, so. And that's that's very interesting. That was quite funny. The two and a half implementations. Um, uh, now um, we have some very ten technical uh, people listening to our podcast, but we have also some people who may not be that familiar with the different roles that different software has in RPKI. What are routing editor and Krill? What are they used for? What are the roles within the whole RPKI ecosystem? Right. Uh, <clears throat> to start with Routinator, Routinator, or yes, I should say Routinator. <laughs> I was, there's always this discussion, should you say root or route? And I'm, so I'm inclined to call it Routinator, but my colleague Martin insists that it should be Routinator. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, Routinator is an RPKI uh, validator. Or, a number of different validators in the world. Um, what an RPKI validator does is that it looks at all the signed material uh, in the resource public key infrastructure, starting at uh, the five RERs. The RERs have um, a, a trust anchor certificate and a key. They delegate uh, resources uh, down a um, certificate chain. Um, Ultimately, the private keys pertaining to these uh, certificates can be used to make attestations about resources, such as uh, root origin uh, attestation objects, which allow a prefix holder to say, um, this uh, prefix of mine is authorized to be uh, rooted by uh, at this ASN. Um, the RERs all provide uh, uh, hosted solutions for this, so um, members can use the, uh, their, their RERs portal to, uh, to create all these objects. Um, and Krill is, 
well, it's it's a piece of software that could be used to uh, fulfill this purpose as well, but it's also something that people can use themselves. So instead of using a portal at the RER, they can then run uh, Krill or similar software themselves and then uh, use it to make the uh, the ROAS and and other things uh, locally. Excellent. Uh, Yeah, we've been having... Langley has provided a hosted service for, I would say, close to 15 reals already. Uh, we have most of our customers in, in hosted mode, which it's very easy to deploy, to start creating your ROAS. There is almost no need to do anything else than just log into Milagnik and create your objects. But it's true that with that... Uh, ease of use, there, there are some limitations. You don't have that much freedom, the validity of the ROAS, how, for how long they are going to be valid. Uh, if you want to de-aggregate your prefixes in many, many, many prefixes, then it creates an overhead for the whole system, but it's not that welcomed by other users. Um, so that's why, actually, this we have this uh, another mode of RPKI called delegated mode. Lightning has has had delegated mode for close to three years already, but we have had very little uptake. We have like three customers, something like that. Yesterday, you had a really good, great presentation about delegated mode RPKI and how to use Grill. How, how Grill could be used by an organization to run RPKI in delegated mode. Uh, can you describe for us and for our audience uh, what delegated RPKI is in in your opinion, what are the most significant pros and cons of delegated mode? Yeah, okay. Um, well, to start with the con, that's the easiest. Uh, it's more work than using uh, a, a service provided by, by the RER. That's, of course, easier. You don't have to run and maintain uh, your own uh, installation. Um, and, and that may well be the best solution for a lot of organizations. However, um, you can use delegated. Um, what happens then is that you do an exchange in the RER, RER's portal, sort of somehow. Uh, it varies from RER to RER how it works exactly, but ultimately it's a, an exchange of two um, XML files between your own system and the RER system so that you can run a, a CA locally, which can then use a protocol um, do we do RFC numbers? Is that interesting? Six six four nine two. I, I know I know it by heart now. <laughs> six four nine two. Um, this is a protocol that it then can use to talk to the uh, parent organization, the RER, or actually you can have uh, delegation that go uh, further as well. Um, and uh, in that dialogue, the child CA asks for a certificate to be signed. So the child holds the private key. It sends a a certificate uh, sign request to the parent and the parent then signs provided of course the child is known and has you know is entitled to resources etc um you can then use the uh your own ca to create your own roas and publish them um so and if that's all you if, if all you're going to do is use your use the user interface of of krill then uh, I, I'd say the advantage over using a, a, a provided service is limited. I mean, then it doesn't really bring you much that you wouldn't get from the service. Um, but delegated can have other advantages. Uh, in particular, I don't know if the uh, if people can use an API with your yeah. uh, portal. They can. Okay. Um, yeah, most RERs have uh, have APIs, um, but. Suppose that you are a customer or a member of multiple RERs, then you need to uh, interact with each, each of them in a different way. That can be quite inconvenient. So if you can run something yourself locally, then you only need to do the setup between you know that and the, each RER once, and then afterwards you have one way of dealing with it. I'd say that's probably uh, the yeah one of the most important advantages. Furthermore, you can set up uh, local access in ways that you like. So you can create your own local users to have access to, uh, to Krill in this, uh, in this case. And that might not be the same people that normally have access to, uh, to the uh, uh, Milaknik uh, portal. 
right? So you have more flexibility there. And then further on, furthermore, um, this would require you to uh, set up your own publication server. But um, what you can also do is you can create child CAs of your own. So if you have a lot of resources, you can create a uh, delegation to say a, a point of presence or a business unit or even a customer and give them specific resources to manage. And then you don't need to do the ROAS for them, but they can do it. That's, that's, that's really interesting. You, you mentioned the, the API and then um, it's, it's good to remember that in, in our region, in Lagnik region, we have the, 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 the RIR of Lagnik, but we also have the two NIRs. We have Ning Mexico, Ning VR, Ning Brazil below Lagnik in the structure of the, the, the IP tree. And in some cases, the APIs that are provided like NIVR in Mexico, Lightning, they're maybe not the same. Uh, they maybe not, perhaps are not exactly compatible because in some cases there are different requirements and regulations. And also there is, um, in the case of the Mi Lightning API, um, since it's intended to be used by, by the wider you know, membership, it has some rate limits built into it so in order to avoid things like hundreds or thousands of in unintended changes that uh, maybe make it like a, a poor match for some requirements that a large IPv4 or IPv6 holder may have. So again I think that using uh, Grill for large organizations makes a lot of sense for the research I mentioned and uh, even if there is an API there is an additional benefit into running your own. You mentioned the publication service. That's interesting because in the way the the RFCs were created, you have this the roles of the CA and the role of where you publish things are two th separate things and they can be run by different organizations. And uh, you had a suggestion for us yesterday in presentation. Would you, would you like to mention that? Yes. I, I have mentioned uh, that there would be Awesome. No, I didn't use that word, but I should, I should have used that word. I would have. Um, uh, if Lacknick uh, could provide a publication service. Uh, NickBR does a similar thing. So NickBR members, uh, if they want to use RPKI, have to use Delegated. But NickBR uh, provides a publication service. And then it's, uh, it's much easier to run your own system because you, know, you can just run it. It publishes uh, at the NIR in this case. And uh, you don't need to worry about the availability, uh, the 24-7 availability over the uh, two protocols used to retrieve uh, RPK objects. So essentially uh, HTTPS and RSync. Um, you can do this yourself. It's, <clears throat> it is definitely possible, but there are some things to think about. Um, in particular, uh, if you have multiple nodes, then you need to think about how you keep those uh, nicely in sync so that uh, validation software doesn't get confused. Uh, and there are some tricks to that. If you're willing to put in the time and effort, then you can definitely do it. But it's much easier to uh, use a service provided by somebody else. Also from a relying party, relying party is let's say the official word for uh, RPKI validators. Um, also from the point of view of RPKI validators, uh, I think we are seeing a lot of repositories pop up, and, and not all, all of them are, you know, as good as the next one, as well maintained, as well reachable. Um, and this can also cause issues. So as an industry, I think we're better off if we uh, use centralized uh, repositories as much as possible. I don't think the centralization is something to be scared of in this case. I mean, you, you run your OCA, you have your own key, so you sign your things, um, but yeah, if they are then published somewhere centrally, you still have control over it. You bring up an interesting point. So some people could be afraid or worried that you are, I mean, everything is being published in a single publication service, for example, for a big, a big region or a big country like Brazil. But uh, I wonder how difficult it is to change publication services. Yeah, <laughs> actually I have a, a draft on that that I should revive. In the, in the ITS. Um, we, we kind of support it in Krill, but there's, uh, we should have some discussion in the ITF as to what is the best way officially to do this. 
essentially what you can do is a, is a key rollover. So you um, create a new key pair, and then um, you configure your system to publish the material for that key pair in a new uh, publication server. And then um, you go through the phases of a, of a key rollover, so you introduce a new key, then at some point you publish all the material uh, under that new key instead of the old key, and then uh, you remove the old key. Okay. Uh, and that is actually implemented um, based on the normal key rollover procedure, pr procedure. But I think we should probably have some discussion in the ITF because what you probably want in this case is that the material, the ROAS, uh, etc., are in both places for some time. So you don't run the risk of stuff not being found and not being available. Uh, it's better to then make it and then remove it, I think. But that's going to require some uh, talks on standards. Oh, definitely. So, uh, again, you, I'm, I'm going to just elaborate a little bit on what you said for perhaps our less technical technical uh, portion of our audience. Um, the publication points for RPKI are the places where the relaying parties go or the validators go to fetch the files they need to validate. So uh, these files have URLs that actually uh, serve as locators for the next object so you can traverse the tree. So when you're changing places where you publish, you need to be sure that during the change, validators will, will be able to find objects they need and they may be, you know, due to DNS details and some other, other transient, transient issues in the internet, they may need to have objects in both places at least for a while, you know, some minutes or hours or something like that. So you mentioned the ATF, which is kind of interesting because my next question was related to that. I actually met you during an ATF meeting, like, I don't remember, it was 13 or 14 years ago. That's a long time ago. So I know you're a very active and a, a quite prolific, actually, contributor to the ATF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Can you, would you like to elaborate on that? What do you like? What do you don't like about the ATF? I mean, I think we've covered the ATF before in this podcast mm -hmm. and in lightning meetings. So probably our audience is familiar with that. So I would love to hear your comments, ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Complaints. Uh, complaints. <laughs> yes. So, yes. An engineer and a lawyer walk into a room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's a bit like that sometimes. Um, I really like the idea of the ITF. And, uh, and it has its moments where it actually works. <laughs> um, I mean, the idea is that um, people... Uh, you know, from all over the world and, and, and different backgrounds, different uh, companies, organizations uh, work together to make interoperable uh, uh, solutions for the, well, mainly for the internet. The main focus of the ITF is on, uh, I, I'd say, on DNS and routing and, uh, yeah, some crypto uh, things as well, but it's a bit below my radar, strangely enough. <laughs> uh, uh, no, but I mean, uh, we use it, but we use a specific uh, part of it, and there's, of course, a, a lot more to be done. Um, so, yeah, where was I? Maybe I should rephrase this. <laughs> um, so, no, the IETF is, uh, is a standards body, and, um, um, you know, even uh, router vendors who might be competitors, you know, um, in the real world, well, the routers need to talk to each other, right? So you need to find common ground. You need to have a common understanding of protocols uh, to make that work, right? So they have a, a, a joint interest to make something that will work uh, interoperably. And, uh, and, and yeah, that goes on from there. Um, same, things applies. Uh, same thing applies to RPKI, of course. Implemented uh, different implementations. You want them all to work together uh, well. Um, so that side of it, I think, is very, uh, very nice. What's not so nice is that it can take a long time to uh, to reach consensus. Uh, that sometimes people are very opinionated and things can get heated. Um, it's okay, I think, as long as there's like uh, professional disagreement. Um, but yeah, 
it's that there's a line where sometimes people become even personal and it's uh, it's not great and I think the ITF is uh, really trying to address that as well um, I have seen some improvement in that lately to be honest and uh, which is good uh, because it should really be about uh, uh, technical arguments and technical merits and uh, it's okay to disagree it's also okay not to be friends as long as you you know keep working towards a common goal because, you know, that I think is the one thing that everybody there does have. People who uh, take time to participate in the ITF, I believe all of them really have a, have a motivation and an intrinsic drive to, to make things better. It's just the agreeing on what that means that's sometimes difficult. <laughs> Completely agree with that. It was a perfect description. <laughs> yeah, I definitely... I think we sh we share this uh, appreciation for the goal of the ATF. I think it's a very worthy goal, and I think it's one of the things that have made the internet, as we know it, possible. Because as you just described, the the possibility of competitors getting inside the same room and trying to get something that works for both of them, it's something that hardly will happen outside an environment like the ATF. Yeah, I, I agree also that has some how to put it politely, there's some cultural issues uh, that I think are being addressed. And I think I, I, I also perceive some, some positive change in that regard. Uh, but I, I believe it's still a very relevant uh, standards body and I hope that yes. uh, it will keep being so for a long time. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting that in, in, in your company, I mean, you, in a way, depend on the output of the ETF in order to produce software that actually interoperates with other products. And also something that I find very, very interesting and very, I would say, admirable in a way, is how you guys have been able to build a company, an organization that actually thrives on building open source software. Uh, this may be... Uh, Maybe this is a uh, strange topic for the Lagnik podcast, but I think many members of our audience will like to hear your thoughts on that, you know, building an organization that thrives on open source software. Yes. Yeah. I think Alex Bond is our uh, main person for this, and he could uh, he could talk about this for hours. For hours. And, yes. <laughs> but I can, do, uh, I can do my version of it. Um, well, speaking for our Nelnet Labs, it um, originally was created when, well, there was the internet in the Netherlands, the first internet was called Nelnet. That was sold off commercially, and uh, there was a big bag of money at the time, and a decision to use that for the good of the internet. Um, then Nelnet Labs was born as a uh, small group of uh, developers focusing on um, DNS software, so critical software for the, for the internet. Um, and then NLNet, so where NLNet is different than from NLNet Labs, NLNet was funding NLNet Labs, uh, you know, to, from the money that they got from the sale. Um, but that's no longer the case. I mean, we uh, NLNet has changed. Uh, the The money from the or original sale is mostly gone. Uh, they've become an organization that gets uh, funding through other sources. So there are various sources, governments, or I don't know. Um, um, and what, what's the word I'm looking for? Inheritance, or I don't know. <laughs> they, I, I don't exactly know how they do that. That's a bit beyond my radar. But they get money with the, um, um, with the goal of finding people, the right people, to, to work on uh, so far that's relevant to the internet mostly. That's the main focus. Um, so sometimes we apply for funding at an LNAT. There's also other organizations that have, and it does have, fulfill similar roles, like uh, the Sovereign Tech, uh, tech Fund. Uh, recently we, we, we put in a, a request for them. Um, some of the RERs have community funds uh, that people can use um, to apply for a, a, a project. Right? So um, an LNAT Labs gets money through this process sometimes. Um, so funding to do a specific thing. 
Uh, other than that, we sometimes get donations, um, and uh, we also have support contracts. Um, and support contracts are sometimes a way for organizations uh, that will just work better with their organizational structure as well um, to to yeah to fund us um, because uh, yeah we pro do provide a critical infrastructure and um, you can use it for free so you don't have to pay but yeah we have to all pay our mortgages and you know eat and mm -hmm. buy gifts Mots, for the kids yes and buy food and gifts for the kids. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that can only really work stably if you have yeah some income that is kind of equivalent to the expenses, right? And uh, and fortunately, there are uh, also organizations who understand that and who are then willing to uh, well either work with us and say uh, we we want to request that you build a specific uh, extra bit of functionality, or we'll take a, a support contract with you. Uh, essentially allowing you to keep maintaining the software and add new things to it as uh, yeah, as they come up. And um, some people then have very specific wishes about things they want, and others, they, they, they feel like, no, it's just enough to know that it, uh, it will remain stable and that you do a good inventory of you know, what the, the best next thing is to build. So there's all these different flavors. There's, uh, let's say, in the broad sense, community funds, there's uh, uh, donations. I think there's a very small percentage for us, actually. And then uh, there's the support contracts with the understanding that, yeah, we're a small organization. So, yeah, sometimes we, we run into issues with that. If, uh, uh, like, a company expects that we have 24-7 support and, you know, pick up the phone at 2 a.m. and fix your issue, that's, that's not what we can do with support. But what we can do with support is talk to you, think through how... Uh, deployment should work. Do no. and second line uh, support. Like if there is an issue, it'll really help you. To, yeah, understand what it is about. Um, but not so much the uh, twenty four seven operational support. Right. I mean, we're not the organization for that. So what 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 was the idea behind going open source? Do you see do you see value in it? Do you get valuable community feedback for your code? Or is it just, you know, something you feel about personally? Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a, yeah. Maybe it's out of principle for quite a few people. I, I, I think open source is also a really, really good model. Um, and, um, yeah, I think as we have shown, you can also you can you can run a uh, an organization making open source without you know selling the software as such. Um, we are very happy to have Alex, who is really good at chasing this. I I think this is a, a difficulty for you know people who uh, who don't have that structure around them. If you're an open source developer, then um, and you don't have that supporting organization, then it, it, it's harder to to do this. And I think for those people, it's probably more of really like a fundamental uh, choice uh, out of principle uh, that they want to do this. Um, <clears throat> but more often than not, there is also a, an organization behind those other people. Um, in any case, what I'm trying to say is, uh, yeah, for me, I find open source important. I think it's, uh, it is for the good of the internet, for, you know... <laughs> <laughs> whatever that means um no but i just like it uh, and uh you know i think it should it should be more the norm than it is today i understand that for example when uh when i was working at ripe ncc there was also a call to to make software open source um but the problem with that was uh mainly that uh with that you're also going to gather uh, questions and you need to support people and uh, so sometimes for bigger organizations, um, you know, they might not want to be secretive about that code. So in that sense, they could open source it. But uh, they may not have the resources to then also deal with uh, people, you know, asking about it and, and trying to use it. So, uh, yeah. Okay. That's just really interesting. I also believe that... Uh, the open source model is a really good match for the internet in general because it's really hard 
to make some of these pieces of software uh, without the, the whole feedback of the community. And without open source, there will be high barriers of entry to different technologies. So let me go back to something more technical and more even, and say, nerdy, if you will. Uh, you and I have, have had conversations over the years about your choice of programming language for Routinator and Credit, right? Mm -hmm. Which Rust these days is is a hot topic. Everybody yes. talks Rust. Everybody thinks that is the future of the you know of the software world. Yeah. But back then, it wasn't it wasn't like that. I mean, I was kind of at a surprise by your choice mm -hmm. in the beginning. Would you like to, to elaborate on that? <laughs> if you didn't, yes. Um, why Rust? My Rust, yes. In Rust, in Rust, we trust. In Rust, we yeah, trust. I see. Um, why Rust? Um, well, I think this was prompted for us by uh, uh, my colleague uh, Martin Wopman, who has experience in Rust. And, uh, and it's a fairly small organization that we are. Um, I think if you're going to make a transition into a new software, a bit to a new language. Um, it helps if you're small, and it helps if you have somebody who really knows that language inside out, so they can you know coach and help other people. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult. So I wouldn't say that Rust is definitely for everyone. Right? It depends on the people you have, on the goals you have, and uh, you know you should do what's right for you. For us, Rust was we had a lot of trust in it because of Martin's experience. Martin started making a Routinator in Rust before I joined EM, and uh, and that worked really well. Then when I joined um, and I um, started working on Krill, I spent some time also looking at uh, alternative uh, languages. I, I looked at Go, but uh, it quickly decided that it wasn't for me, um, yeah, mainly because of the way that it deals with error handling and dependencies and I, I don't know, I just found it uh, unwieldy. And uh, yeah, Rust is, um, I think, quite, the things are moving fast, but it's quite mature in a lot of ways. It's a modern language and uh, what they promise is that, uh, I mean, you have modern features, like you can do object-oriented style if you really want, you can do functional style. Um, but the compiler, yeah, it's really slow to compile. But the compiler takes a lot of time to then produce code that is actually uh, close to as fast as uh, a C is, and you can you can also code really, yeah. You can do things that you can can do in C. You can also do in in, in Rust mostly. It gives memory safety by design. Um, values can exist, uh, have to live somewhere. So either you have it or you have a reference to it. And if you have a reference to it, then you can only have it for as long as it lives. And that's where the borrow checker comes around to go. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> if you try to start, you know, if you're new to Rust and if, uh, like, I, I had done coding in, in Java and in Scala, so JVM, uh, garbage collected uh, uh, languages, uh, where... You know, you can just create things and forget about them, and yeah, no worry, no worries. Now, if you start coding like that in Rust, and for the first three months, you're going to learn. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, it's, it's going, going to be, be uh, uh, it's going to be <laughs> rough. rough, but uh, you'll get there. And then once it really clicks, then it becomes really easy. Then, uh, you know, so that that you know, if somebody's thinking of starting a project in Rust. I think nowadays there's probably also good courses online. Uh, I have not done them because I could learn them on the job with my colleague. But uh, be prepared for some, yeah, some struggles in the beginning, but they pay off in the end. That's, that's yeah. good to hear. I mean, yeah, this it, Rust has actually exploded in the world of software in the past, I would say, a couple of years. But uh, again, 10 years ago, was it wasn't that well known, actually. Yeah, it was five, six years ago that we uh, really started with it. Um, and it has been like number one of most liked uh, uh, programming languages for a long time. Right. And uh, so it is very much liked by the developers. And I think for good reason. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So 
Tim, let me thank you for your time. It was a really interesting uh, interview. The spoke of the episode. I, I really enjoyed uh, doing this with you. Uh, any last words that you may care to share with us? Um, well, no, thank you for uh, having this talk. Maybe we should just do it again in another, <laughs> what is it, 13, 13 years? Right. <laughs> discuss what programming <laughs> language are we using there yeah, so all these young kids with their new languages uh, 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 yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah we can have that talk in 13 years <laughs> thank you very much to our audience I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of the Langnick podcast where we discuss RPKI delegated RPKI programming language programming languages open source and the ATF so uh, come back for more Langnick podcasts ¿Escuchaste? Escuchaste el LACNIC Podcast. Suscríbete a nuestro canal y conoce de primera mano los próximos episodios.